And so just to give you a little bit of framework for what I'm going to focus on during our short time together, is that first, I want to convince you that an administrative data can and should be managed earlier in its life cycle. Um, and second, and this I'll spend a little bit less time on, um, but I want to, to present some ideas about how doing so requires both what I call top-down and bottom-up approaches. And the examples I'm going to use today are specific to administrative data in the United States, where I am from. Um, though I'm really interested to hear what parallels you see in your all's national context, and I hope you find me around the conference these next uh, day or two to, to let me know what you see there. Um, so to start with, I want to give a little bit of a definition of what I mean when I say administrative data. So as distinct from sources of research data, administrative data is collected in the context of ordinary operational processes and procedures. So in order to do a job of some sort, often within a government context, though certainly in, in, in industry and, and other contexts as well. Um, and although it is not collected with a particular research question or use in mind, it can and often is used downstream for research purposes. Um, and a great example of this is something like hospital charge codes, which are, of course, collected with the hospital context in order to um, carry out hospital operations and to do customer billing. Um, but they can be a very, very rich source of research data because they allow for the analysis of what sorts of treatment interventions were done within a hospital um, and can be used in multitudinous contexts like public health for research. And administrative data is a great source of research data because it is often very uh, large scale um, and is also collected across long periods of time. So it can be a very good longitudinal source of data. Um, it's often less resource intensive to collect because it is already being collected, though making it useful for research purposes may be resource intensive in its own right. Um, and it is also less obtrusive to participants to collect, something that can be particularly important um, in situations in which the, the research subject um, involves very vulnerable or sensitive populations. Um, and the act of going in to collect research data um, in the traditional way can be uh, very obtrusive. However, there are some well-documented challenges with administrative data, um, and particularly its use within research contexts. Um, one is gaining access. Um, open government data portals are improving this, but there are lots of sources of administrative data that are still not in portals, and that you have to kind of know someone, the, the processes of who you need to contact and what data is and is not allowed to be accessed and under what conditions is often very opaque. Um, this information is also distributed across a number of different um, systems, and often individuals um, are not identified uniquely in order to link them across these systems. Um, and there's often irregular or missing definitions of variables, um, as well as uh, quite the lack of documentation in many cases. But above all, uh, people, when they talk about the use of administrative data for research purposes, are very concerned about data quality. Um, and we'll come back to this quote a little bit later, um, but this is from a, a research study looking at human, um, human services organizations um, across the entire United States, um, doing a bunch of qualitative interviews with them, um, and finding, as we all know, that poor quality data collection processes cannot be readily corrected after the fact. There are many challenges with working with administrative data that can be overcome with creative research design, um, but poor quality is one of those that really cannot be accounted for. So as I promised, I'm going to be talking about how we can extend some ideas of research data management into this space. Um, and so these are existing practices that have been developed over the course of the last about decade and a half um, in order to improve the secondary use of research data. And so just for a quick definition, research data management is usually um, applied to this life cycle concept of data. And I don't have time, unfortunately, to go through all of the stages of the research data life cycle and how it improves the secondary use of research data. But I do want to highlight kind of two key phases. Um, the first is this beginning one here, plan and design. Um, and this is um, an important phase because within research data management, the way that these processes have developed is that the research team themselves are responsible for developing a document called a data management plan that explains how they are going to um, 
actually manage and organize and document their data over the course of the life cycle such that it has enough context to be useful in a secondary context. And this supplements kind of more formal data governance practices because it focuses on the on the ground realities of what the actual research team needs to do in order to make sure that these steps happen. And then second, I wanna draw your attention to kind of the far end of the life cycle. So after a scientific project has gone on, the data has been analyzed, collaborations have happened. Um, and the point here is that the research data management life cycle starts with the idea of sharing and reuse in mind. Um, and this is significant because the reuse value of data is greatly enhanced by management practices that begin as early as possible in the life cycle of a project. And you manage data somewhat differently if you're contextualizing it for subsequent reuse than you do just to facilitate the use within the original context. So to try and make this a little bit more concrete, I'm gonna dive into a specific case study that's very close to my heart. This is the context that I originally started working with data in, which is child welfare in the United States. Um, and with this case study, I hope to demonstrate a little bit what kind of an administrative data lifecycle might look like. Um, so to begin with, child welfare is the term that is used for the systems that are used to investigate and prevent allegations of child maltreatment and neglect. So this includes things like foster care, though also supportive services for families where the children still remain in the home. Um, as such, there is a wide array of connected service systems um, because it is not just the caseworkers that exist within the child welfare system itself, but also an array of supportive services. Um, and as I mentioned, this is the context in which I first began managing data. I moved on to work with Earth Sciences data at the federal context, and now I work with all sorts of researchers within a university. Um, but I've continued to think about how the, the skill set that I have developed could have applied to wor the work that I did at this time, and how to still reach back out to those communities and start to see that change. So I'm going to start with a bird's eye view of this child welfare data. Um, and this is because the national data is what is most visible to the public and by far the easiest to access. So this national data takes the form of statistics. Um, and these can be found in numerous governmental reports. Um, and since 1988, so quite a ways back, you've also been able to access the underlying data in a national archive called the National Data Archive on Child Abuse and Neglect. Um, and this data that makes up the federal statistics and those underlying federal data, set, data sets is collected by the federal government from all of the 50 US states. And they are incentivized to participate um, because they receive federal funding if they contribute this information. And the archive that collects this data does a really good job of normalizing across very different um, practices um, in the different states because they do not all define child abuse the same way, and they certainly don't have a service system that works in the same way across all of the 50 US states. Uh, but it's very well documented. You have great lengthy code books um, and a lot of professional service staff. They have staff statisticians that provide support um, as well as robust communities of practice. So this is an example of administrative data working really well. It's clear how you access it. It has the documentation necessary to reuse it. Um, and it has well-established communities in order to help you work with it. However, it represents a strategy that is sometimes referred to in the literature as research-ready administrative data in that it's an ad hoc process. It takes data that's already been collected and it cleans it up and curates it and presents it for research use. But as I mentioned, the federal government is not collecting the information itself. So that is very much an end of life cycle ad hoc after the fact process. Um, whereas this data actually originates in the, the 50 states. And to support the individual states and their different child welfare systems in collecting this information, the federal government in the US also at the end of the 90s um, with implementation in about 2000, developed statewide automated systems for collecting this information. So they have some technical infrastructure. Um, moreover, they've also updated those statewide information systems recently with a new model that uh, makes it easier for states to get, back, get information back out after they've entered it in. So they incentivize the use of it by actually making it more functional for those frontline workers. 
Um, as well as by allowing the systems to be kind of like a linked system of modular information systems, um, which also makes it more practical for a distributed service system. Um, and this reflects kind of a general trend in the last decade of a federal investment in both data governments as well as local data capacity building initiatives. Um, nevertheless, the access conditions for the state data are very opaque. There's a lot of documentation in the literature about how hard it is. Um, as well as um, there, there are some shortcomings with these capacity building programs in that they don't often provide a very clear definition of what capacity they're trying to build when they say data capacity, whether that means the ability to analyze data, the ability to use or create technical solutions, um, or something else altogether, like as I'm talking about data management, which is kind of a, a third data skill separate from those two. And finally, we've gotten even more broken down into our map, that state data is not actually the original point of collection um, because this child welfare service system is highly distributed um, across um, not just smaller geographic subdivisions but individual offices where people work and collect information. Um, and sometimes that program data is a state-run office, but this is also a highly privatized service system um, such that a lot of these organizations are actually small not-for-profits. Um, and much as the state information is aggregated into national data sets, the state data itself is aggregated from all of these small program offices. And the expectation when you read about this service system in the literature is that you can kind of just drill down to the state level and that that's enough. You don't need to look at all of the offices where the information is collected because they just use those statewide information systems that I was talking about on the previous slide. But this is the context in which I worked. <laughs> and I know that to not be true um, because often the actual operational needs of these program offices are different than what was designed by those information systems. And so shadow systems are created, alternate information systems that represent the actual on the ground needs of the people working in these offices. And how that information is controlled or organized or managed is something that there is basically no documentation on at all. No one is looking at it and no one knows the quality of it. But overlooking that program data ultimately means that efforts to improve child welfare data quality don't start at the beginning of the life cycle. So this is basically just a different visualization of a research data life cycle like the one that I showed on the page where I was defining research data management. What I've done, however, is I've just placed where the different types of child welfare data that I was talking about kind of fall on this. And the program data is really where the information is collected. Another way of putting this is that there's a long tail, so to speak, of data management need in child welfare. Um, taken on their own, the program offices may collect kind of small amounts of data. However, cumulatively, the effects of not building data management capacity within all of those program offices affects the quality of both state and national data. In other words, <laughs> poor quality data co collection processes cannot be corrected after the fact. And to close, because I only have a, a couple of minutes here, I wanted to offer a few reflections about how this need that I've hope, hopefully identified um, can be addressed through earlier intervention. And I think that there are some lessons to be drawn from research data management here as well. Um, so on the top down side, data management in the United States really originated from a memorandum from the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy in 2013 that required federal agencies that provide research funding to develop policies for data management and sharing that researchers would comply with. This memorandum has actually just been updated in August of 2022. And this is what caused kind of a, a wave of data management um, development in US research. But the more meaningful changes that came was the acceleration and shifting cultures and how research data is treated. Um, so for one, this spurred the professionalization of data management as a distinct competency that is a skill set that is unique from what is needed just to analyze data and is also unique from what is needed to develop software in infrastructures or technology. 
It also spurred the development of disciplinary communities who have worked together to rise to meet the needs of managing different sorts of research data. And so what I propose is that this development of top-down and bottom-up approaches is kind of its own sort of life cycle. When there are top-down mandates that prioritize the development of these, these sorts of um, processes, that also spurs the development of communities who go on to inform the next wave of policy changes, as we saw with the recent update to this memorandum that was first issued in 2013. So to summarize, administrative data should and can be managed earlier in its life cycle. We saw that within research data. This is a concept that can be applied in other contexts. There is no reason to point at administrative data as being inherently lower quality. And doing so will very likely require both top-down and bottom-up approaches. So I'm happy now for the, the last couple of minutes to take any questions. My email address is also here, and I would be happy to, to talk to you later at the conference. Thank you. Thanks very much. Do we have questions in the room? <laughs> Thanks for, for the talk. Um, there you go. Uh, I want to ask you about uh, like two things that might be different uh, between administrative data and research data. One of them is uh, about and like how do you manage consent when you're talking about administrative data and also costs like um i bet that these offices of child um uh, welfare like have the data budget budget and tight budgets perhaps and so going to them and telling okay you need to to plan and administrate your data differently uh in a way that is not like focused on what they do but on, on the downstream effects of the data, uh, how do you manage that? Yes, those are great and I think largely unanswered questions. Um, there was so much I wanted to fit into this presentation and I settled on trying to outline a problem. Um, and I think that there are many other issues with enacting um, more data and management of administrative data at the source and funding and consent are two big ones. The thing that concerns me is that no one seems to be asking this question. They seem to be just starting so late in the process that there are many issues that in fact deserve a lot of attention and research that deserve debate within the community that just isn't happening at all. Um, and so I, I don't have a, a very pat answer to either of those issues right now so much as I've just been um, speaking about this issue everywhere I can, trying to, to find like-minded like people in order to start advancing some of these conversations. We might have time for one quick question, if anyone has one. Thank you. Uh, to your answer, <laughs> I just I have a comment because I also work for the uh, Statistics Bureau here in the city of Buenos Aires, and we do manage a lot of administrative data, and we have some protocols on how to treat like um, anonymous, um, how do you say, like when you, make, you want to make the data anonymous. So we have like a, a law and a regulation that covers all that. So we can talk later. But my question is about um, what do you do with the data? Because you talk about your research and I'm really interested in about like what type of uh, conclusions are you making based on the data that you are managing? So that's an interesting question. I, um, I don't directly analyze this child welfare data myself. So kind of my career trajectory, I worked in kind of like a program administration support role, helping to manage, so kind of organize, provide documentation for um, work with researchers who we might be sharing the data with um, in order to provide context. Um, and I largely didn't know what I was doing at that point. I went back to grad school. <laughs> transition to the management of research data. And I now work as a, a, a librarian and I work across disciplines helping researchers figure out how to manage and contextualize their data for open data sharing, largely under the, the kind of federal policies that I was talking about within the US. And so my research is um, kind of like a step removed from the direct analysis of the administrative data itself. I'm interested in, in this particular question here, which is how can we manage this data? Um, and so that is the topic that I'm researching rather than analyzing the data itself. Um, I think we need to change. So big applause for Kelsey Badger for a great talk. <laughs> <laughs>